Thank you, Jesus. All right. Hebrews chapter 6. So we're talking last week, we talked about these six just primary, just ground level doctrines of the early church. And, and we, so last week we talked about the laying on of hands. Let's read our Bibles. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. And I believe Paul wrote the, the book of Hebrews. Some people will debate and say it's Barnabas. But therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines. So these are six primary doctrines that were essential for the foundation and the laying of the early church. Of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and instructions about washings. Now, what's instructions about washings? Well, the Greek word is baptizo. But we got our word baptisms. Let's not talk about the elementary teachings of baptisms, the laying on of hands. That's what we talked about last week. If you missed that, we talked about the laying on of hands and how impartation of gifts happen and how healing happens through the laying on of hands. And today we're going to talk about baptisms and, and how that operates. So let's, let's talk about baptisms. How many people have been water baptized? And for a lot of us, that's really good. For a lot of us, when we talk about baptisms, we're like, is that all? That's all there is. Baptism. Like, baptism. I was baptized. But the Bible talks about more. The Bible's going to talk about a baptism of fire. The Bible's going to talk about a baptism of, of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to get into those tonight. How many people have been baptized in the Holy Spirit? How many people want more? All right, I do too. So, so let's talk about baptisms tonight. I mean, let's get through this. John the Baptist is going to come with this revolutionized, a revolutionary message to the Jewish people. And he's going to talk about baptisms. John is going to be called the baptizer. God sent John to prepare the way. He's the one that's going to open up. Old covenant, and for the, the Jewish people of the old covenant days, they thought they were right with God by, okay, uh, we were Gentiles, we got circumcised, now we're part of the tribe. And they thought that was the coming into. They would give offerings and sacrifices. But John is going to come up with this radical message about about repentance from sin. Literally, repent means to turn and to walk away from. And that's that old covenant mindset that John was so radical in. John comes into this climate. He's the messenger. He's, he's the messenger and the Messiah. And to the Jews of the time, John was doing something just unusual. How many people know that when God does something new, it's usually unusual? Like I remember when Toronto happened, people were like, that cannot be God. And you know what it forces us to do is go, where in history has this ever happened before? And what happened in Toronto 30 years ago is just normative and revival moves. So we have a group called the Quakers, and they got the name Quakers, not because they invented oatmeal, but they got the name Quakers because the Holy Spirit would come upon them, and they would shake, and people would shake. And John Wesley is going to record meetings where people would laugh. He'd go into parishes, and people would laugh. How many of you guys know... I, he, John, uh, Psalm chapter 2 says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. And, and we, one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is joy. So we have this attitude, like, can you imagine, like, Jesus jokes up there? I have no idea. But the Bible says he laughs. It's just, oh, you guys are ridiculous. And so, but when people laugh in the context of revival, like, well, that can't be God. People cry sometimes. So there's a four-square uh, four movement. Amy Simple McPherson was the founder of the four-square movement. She called these manifestations. And a manifestation, we think of the word manifest, and we a lot of times think of the context of demonic things, but in the context of manifestation in church things, they're what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And so I remember my first manifestation, I was with Carl McCauley at a church in Southern California, and there was a lady from South Africa, and I was up on the altar my first week as youth pastor there, and she comes up and she lays hands on me. And this is pre-Toronto. This is like 1987. And I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. But as she's laying hands on me and I'm on the altar, I'm looking around going, I'm being electrocuted. I'm not talking metaphorically. I'm talking like I felt like I was French kissing a light socket. <laughs> not that I've ever done that. <laughs> I would know that feeling. But my lips started shaking. And, I, and I'm trying to talk to her. And she's like, it was apparent that something was going on. And she's like, are you all right? And I'm trying to convey to her, like, help me. I'm in my moment. And she's like, what did you say? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm going to a lady, and she's like, oh, God bless you. And I'm like, well, get back here, because I didn't know what was happening. And she goes away, and the next thing I know, I look up, and I'm on the ground, on the altar, 
And I look up, and everybody in the whole building is gone, except for this guy, Marvin Ford, who you probably don't know, from a church called Melody Land Christian Center. But Marvin had died for two hours. He's toe-tagged dead in the mortuary, and, right? And this guy named Ralph Wilkerson comes and prays for me. He comes back from the dead. How would you, how, how's that for a testimony, right? <laughs> like, you get up, like, where am I at? Why is that on my toe, and what am I doing down here, right? And so there's this lady, his wife played piano for a lady named Catherine Coleman, right? So I get up and I'm looking, it's four hours later, and I'm there completely sweating. What's that? See, 1 Corinthians 12 says there's a variety of gifts, variety of ministries. So we know what gifts and ministry are. We're pretty comfortable with that. And a variety of effects. And the Greek word effect, energeia, is what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, right? And so... I get up from there, and I don't know what it was, but I just remember, like, if there's such a thing as too much God, maybe it's God cut, I don't know. But I get up, and I'm like, whoo! I just remember giving my keys to Robin, okay? So we, the, so we talk about these experiences, but then when God does everything, we always use that, that thing, well, God is a gentleman. T tell Ananias and Sapphira that, all right, right? God is a gentleman. It's like when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when Jesus reveals himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, they said, we're looking for Jesus. And his response was, I am he. And the glory comes and all the soldiers fall back. Yeah. What did that moment look like? Like, hey, guys, get up. You're supposed to take me away. Come on. I don't know what that looks like. We underrate when the presence of God shows up in such a manifest way. And when John the Baptist shows up in an unprecedented way, that these people had never seen it, but he spoke a message of repentance, which the writer of Hebrew tells us repentance from dead works. And this is an elementary teaching that he's going to give us, that we're going to supposed to, to carry on and, and do, the, 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 the nation of, 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 of Israel. So John made quite an impact. They didn't like John. As a matter of fact, Herod, Herod he's like, this John, he's, he's stirring things up. Now, can we get over this? Somewhere down the line, I think of an American discipleship. We've trained our church to be nice people. Right? Oh, they're such nice boys. But when the apostles come into town in the book of Acts, they aren't called nice boys. They're called, it almost sounds like an MMA thing. Are you with me on that? Ladies and gentlemen, now coming into Jerusalem, the sons of thunder. Are you with me on that? We got to get over that. Because when we come and preach the gospel, it is going to be offensive. Somewhere, hey, if you haven't noticed, the world's getting a little wonky. Yeah. And somewhere down the line, we gotta, there's got to have that baptism, not just of water, but we'll get into this, but of fire and the Holy Spirit. John preached, you're outsiders to the kingdom of God. And John gave them a perspective they can understand. You're going to be part of this new citizenship of God. And it was a radical message for the Jews at that time because they're looking for a Joshua. And transliterated Joshua means Jesus. So when they're looking for this king to come in, they're looking for a Joshua like, you're going to bring us in. You're going to bring us into this promised land. But they didn't understand that his kingdom is not of this world. When we use the word kingdom, wherever there's a king, it's the king's domain. And in the king's domain, these things follow us. Isn't that awesome? These things will follow those who believe. We're believers. Isn't that all? Like we don't have to chase them. That's just part of the inheritance. It's part of what, what's in our tribe. It's part about being in the house. When being born from above, now you have access to the fathers. Isn't that awesome? Like I don't know how it rolls in your house. I have five daughters. And they would invite all their friends. So it was really common with my family growing up that we would quite often have 11 to 12 kids in our house. And not once did my, my daughters ever say, Dad, is it okay if my friends have something to eat? No. There were tubs of ice cream that would vanish just like that. <laughs> it, it would just be gone. They, they, they didn't feel any good. They knew that if it's in my father's house, it's mine. And, and so we needed to have that attitude that what's in the father's house in these early doctrines, they're ours. They're just not for a people 2,000 years ago. He was writing in this book of Hebrews, so you guys go, hey, Hebrews chapter 8, if there's a new covenant, right, if the old has become obsolete and has passed away, and in this new covenant promise, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anybody is in Christ, they are a 
Whoa. See, we focus on the old all the time, right? I'm a sinner saved by grace. If I just get better up. But the Lord said, no, you are a new creation. And it's almost like a declaration. Behold, all things have become new. What does the new look like? Well, I'm just a sinner. Well, we're seated with him in heavenly places, and sin can't be in the presence of God. But you can, because of the blood, the Hebrews is going to tell us, we can come boldly into his presence. And it's not a, a timid thing. 2 Timothy 1.7. You haven't received a spirit of fear, timidity, but a power, love, and a sound mind. So what does that look like? Like, I'm coming into his presence, and the devil's going to go, oh, you're a sinner. Look how bad you messed up this week. Oh, you can't do that. Yeah, I can, because I got something, a blood covenant that's established that my Bible says, I can come boldly into his presence. I'm clean. I'm washed and come into his presence. So let me get back to my notes, because I just did a rabbit trail there and a half. So this baptism of repentance, that's what John speaks. That's, that's kind of where we go down. In the early church, to get baptized doesn't look like how it is today. In the early church, they, you would go through a year of catechism. And, and they would do it, they would do it, and they actually had, so if you don't believe that women could be ministers, they had women deaconess that would baptize the women, and they would have men who would be deacons, who would baptize the men. Why is that? Because back in those days, when you got baptized, you get baptized naked. That's how they do it, right? Because you're coming in as a child. How did we all enter? Right, naked. And so they would baptize you in water, and you come out of the water, and immediately they do, and this Orthodox church still does this. It's, called, it's part of their, their sacraments. It's called the charism. Has anybody heard of the charism? Charismatic, any along those lines? You would come out of the water and they pour oil over your head with the expectation that you are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It was just, that was normative New Christ, Testament Christianity back in the day. See, in the West, we go, well, the reason Christianity spread so profusely was because of Constantine. There's a guy from Yale, Dr. Ramsey McMullen. He refutes that. He goes, that's not true at all. Most of the Western European Empire was already, the Roman Empire, was already Christianized by the time, the time Constantine came about. He's not a believer. And he said the reason was because of the demonstrative miracles of the early church. And he's going to go talk about Paul coming in and cursing the temple Delphi. How would you like to be in that day? In the name of Jesus, I command this pagan idolatry to fall. And all of a sudden, there's a rumble. And the whole temple collapsed. How does that happen? Well, it happens in Acts 1a because you shall receive power to be a witness. I don't know where you guys are at. I want the power to tear down the idols of culture today. I want to see those things that are like, oh, those are giants. I want that Caleb spirit, right? Because number 13 really gives it out like this. These are leaders in the, in the 12 tribes. They all go out. Ten come back and go, they're giant in the land. They're, and we became like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and so we were. Do you get that? How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself? Oh, a grasshopper. <laughs> I am a grasshopper. Or do you see yourself? I'm a giant slayer. Caleb had, Caleb had, what the Bible says, Ca now Caleb had a, a different spirit. And what does a different spirit go? Uh, you are looking at yourself through the lens of the eyes of the world, but I'm looking through my eyes through the kingdom because I am a kingdom person. I'm a, I'm, listen, I'm a giant killer. And so at 80 years old, Caleb, this should be encouraging to you, Dave. Caleb said at 80, I'm just as strong now as I am at 40. I'm take where, what up? Bring on the giants. Somewhere down the line, we need to have that sons of thunder, power, fire, anointing come back into the church and go, what will they think? Who cares? What? The world doesn't care what we think because we're weak sauce instead of operating in the power of what we are as a new creation. We're not living in the what if. And what do I mean by the what if? What if what God says to me is actually true? What if I can do all things through him who strengthens me? What if the greater things shall I do? Because he's seated at the right hand of God. What if? That what if looks and goes, woo! I don't know how this is going to look, but it's going to be fun. I'll get back to my notes. 
So let me get down to baptism of fire. That might save us some time, okay? Baptism of fire is, a, is an interesting thing. Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist, who showed us what water baptism is all about, a baptism of repentance, a baptism of turning away. When I say the word repent, that's not like, oh, repent. Repent is a nomadic term for a culture, Bedouins that are lost in the desert, and they're looking at each other. Do you know where we're at? I don't know where we're at. Let's repent. We got to go a different way. Now, that's way different than the gospel of reconciliation or salvation that we preach today. We're like, yeah, just ask Jesus in your heart, but you've never turned away. Are you with me on that? Come as you are. Yeah, you come as you are, but you have to repent. That's Acts 2.38. Repent, be baptized, and be filled with the Spirit. So John, this baptism of, of the fire, Matthew 3.11, there's one who comes after me. I'm not even worthy to tie his sandals. And isn't that awesome that Jesus goes in his humanity and is baptized? And what an amazing, what an amazing reputation, representation of the Trinity. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Holy Spirit comes on him and Jesus is there. We always use these examples that get into early church heresies that don't really explain it well. But just go, what is it? The three, three distinct, three distinct. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I love the Holy Spirit. A lot of us have a new trinity today, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Spirit is a person, third person of the Trinity. So John's going to say, there's one who comes after me who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and he baptizes with fire. He baptizes with fire. And so when we talk about a baptism of fire, fire sometimes is a symbol of God's favorable presence. And so the reason I say that is because I, when I read a lot of commentaries today, they're going to say the baptism of fire is the world coming into judgment. And I'm like... I don't agree with that. And I'll save you all the reading, have to read those commentaries that are rolling more on the cessationist side. Okay, what do I mean by cessationism? The gifts ended. I'm a continuist. I believe the gifts have continued on till the day. Are you with me on that? And so, but they'll read it that way. But fire has something to do. So when is, when is the fire something that's favorable? Well, God spoke to Moses in a burning bush. And Gordon Fee will tell us in Acts chapter 2, the tongues of fire a representative, this is so cool, of Colossians 1.27, Christ in us, because in the old covenant, the old has passed away, it's dead. The Holy Spirit would come upon people, right? So now, the tongues of fire in Acts chapter 2 is the Holy Spirit in us. And so where Moses is like, there's a favorable thing. So let me put it another way. Water washes and fire purifies. Water cleanses us. But the fire purifies. So the fire is a visible, physical form of the invisible glory of the Lord. And the fire can operate in a lot of different ways. Hebrews 12, 9 is going to say, our God is a consuming fire. What does that mean? You start a fire. I just got back from YWAM. They showed me how to, and it was an outdoor backpacking DTS. So they're showing us how to make fire, which is really awesome, right? Like we had hatchets and we had knives and we're whittling I don't know what the curly things are in the fire, and they're blowing on it, and fire started, right? And, and the thing with fire is, I found this out, you got to put fuel on it. And that is why in the, in the Old Testament, part of the job of the priests were to daily come into the temple and do a couple of different things. They'd have to make sure there was oil in the lamp, and they would trim the wicks of the lamps. You know why they had to trim the wicks? Because what, what happened yesterday, if they didn't trim the wicks, the oil, the fresh oil, couldn't be drawn out. And so God essentially is like, listen, you can't take what happened yesterday. You need to trim the wicks and have the oil filled up. Oh, I thought that was good. Okay, never mind. <laughs> That's, remember we read about the ten virgins? They're talking about the church. Half had oil, and when he shows up, can I buy some of yours? No, you are responsible as a royal priest to make sure you got the oil. And has anybody ever, uh, once you, has anybody been to Israel? And they have these ancient like oil presses and these big stones and they may weigh like a thousand pounds and they have like a little folk, I don't know if that's the right language, that they take the, the olives, they wrap it up in cloth and they put it under there and it's like a gigantic press. And that gigantic press would squeeze down on the olives and out would come this virgin oil. 
Hey, Pastor Nick, I'm being squeezed. Hey, Pastor Nick, I'm in a situation I've been holding here too long. When does this thing end? Hey, Pastor Nick, can I get, just get out of this? This is feeling uncomfortable, Pastor Nick. When does this burden leave me? Because the oil is being pressed, and the, the thing that you go, oh, yeah. It's like, this is what you're, like, why do, I, why do we have to go through trials and tribulations? Isn't that awesome? The Bible says God disciplines those whom he loves. Isn't that awesome? He just loves you. Yeah, Lord, when does it end? You got any oil? See, that's what, we do a lot of conferences, right? Like, oh, I just want to go, somebody has oil. Maybe I can, like, rub off on me. And God's saying, get your own oil. That's when he's, he's addressing in Hebrews chapter 6. These are the elementary principles. These are the elementary teachings that go about, right? Now, move on to press on to maturity. So what do mature people do? Hebrews 5 tells us, it's this, that by this time you ought to be teachers. But it's those who, because of practice, have their senses trained to eat the meat. Let me rephrase it another way. I'll get James for you. It's not the hearers that are just, but the doers. Oh, you can hear all the time, but when you start doing it, right? I got that P90X a few years ago. didn't do me any good. Those guys were jacked, by the way. I was like, those guys, P90X, man, I want to be like those guys. I just think maybe I should put the DVDs in the thing. I don't know. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon says this. So it could be the apostles. He was a purifier fire. For some people, the fire burns and skins them. But Charles Spurgeon said, the same fire in hell is the same fire in heaven. It just depends on which side you're in. So let's look at three functions of fire. The fire comes as a purifier. It, com it comes to change. It comes to clean. It comes to sanctify. It comes to purify us. Thank you, Jesus, that when we're born again, we're righteous. You're in right standing. But this process of becoming coming pressed into his image. What do I mean by that? My daughters, back in the day, my daughters played with Play-Doh. And back in the day, when my daughters were growing up, we didn't have wood floors, we had shag carpet. And if you don't understand what I'm saying, Play-Doh does not work well with shag carpet. <laughs> and, and I don't know why they had variety of colors, because by the time my daughters got done with it, they were all just mixed up. And they had this thing way back in the day when Lion King was first out, they had a Play-Doh Lion King doohickey game. I don't know what you called it. And they would take their Play-Doh, stuff it in the top of this, this thing, and they push it in, and they would squeeze this lever, and Play-Doh would come out the side and coming out all over the place. And when you open it up, here is this, this lion. Sometimes God puts us in things and you're like, Lord, oh, because you're going to look like me, the king of all kings. He's the lion of the book of Revelation chapter 5 where it says, hey, church, do not weep, do not cry. Have you not heard the lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed? Woo. Woo. Why am I in the press? He's going to have a bunch of cubs, <laughs> a bunch of lion cubs because in his tribe. In his tribe, you're, you're part of this tribe. The tribe reproduces after tribe. And if he's a lion tribe, that means there's lionesses who are fierce. There are lions who are going to roar out in this period of time. Oh, this world is becoming such a mess. Oh, it's such a mess. This is the time the church shines. And when I say the church, I'm talking not, never mind, I won't go down that path. It's consuming the fire. The fire empowers us to fulfill God's calling. Fire is a visible appearance of the invisible glory of God. Fire is the visible appearance of the invisible glory of God. What does that look like? Do you guys remember the Azusa Street Revival? And in 1906, William Seymour, and they're, they're praying and contending for the move of God, William Seymour is like, God's going to restore the gifts. This guy, William Parham, teaching us. They come into Azusa, and we're gonna, tongues are going to be released. And, and, and then the Holy Spirit, the wind of the Holy Spirit, the ruach, the breath, is in this, like, barn in uh, Bonnie Bray's house, and it starts to come. And the fire department shows up at the Azusa Street Revival. Do you guys know this story? The fire department shows up, and they're like, why are you here? Like, the roof is on fire. The roof, the roof. The roof is on fire. <laughs> I was doing an Indonesian young adult retreat in San Bernardino, Big Bear Mountains. 
and the fire department shows up. And I'm telling you, the Lord was baking in that place. The fire of God was in that place. What did that look like? The fire department shows up. Like, why are you here? Well, your neighbor said your roof's on fire. Woo! <laughs> Lord, bring the fire to Raleigh. John Wesley once said, I set myself to fire and people come to watch me burn. I, I, I don't get somebody else to do it. I don't have to get my fire. For like, I'm going to get the fire, not strange fire. I'm going to get the fire. John Wesley said to George Whitfield, and historically, if you don't know George Whitfield, I read his diaries because I couldn't find a lot of, uh, on, on Whitfield. This is, they're both young men. Benjamin Franklin talks about Whitfield speaking to 30,000 people without any electronics. Franklin was mesmerized by him, like, like who is this guy? I didn't fully buy into it. But, but Whitfield, this is Whitfield's life. Day one, I went to this parish. I preached for 15 minutes, and then the presence of God showed up. Day two, I went to this parish. I, I labored for 45 minutes, and then the presence of God showed up. Like, he lived his, he lived his life like, hey, like, we are, I'm going to keep preaching until it calms. And he had a faith for the fire. He had a faith that the fire is going to fall on people. So men who have had the revelation of God and received this fire from God preach with passion and fire in their heart. It's not like, hey, I hope God blesses you, and I, if it's his will that he heals you, I don't know, and, you know, I don't want to offend you or get too radical. Hey, church, the church was meant to be offensive. That's when the Bible says, come out and be separate. Great example of that, a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's a great example of us, of how we can live in Babylon without Babylon living in us. They were thrown into the fire. They were thrown into the fire. And in, in, in history and in archaeological, they said that, that that wasn't just like a Weber barbecue, by the way, okay? They say this thing was about a block, like a block big. It was substantial because it would heat the city. It was that substantial that, that guards just getting around it would be burned. They went into the fire. And when they came into the fire, there was a fourth one dancing with them in the fire. Oh, come on. Do it again, Lord. Do it again, Lord. Zechariah 2, 5. I myself will be a wall of fire around him, declares the Lord, and it will be glory within. Paul says in, in 1 Thessalonians 9, 5, 19, do not quench the spirit. So literally, it's like, don't put water on the flame of what I'm doing. And it's in the context of the gifts. Are you one of those churches? Yeah, we're a New Testament church. I like John Wimber. When John Wimber gets saved, he goes to his pastor and is like, hey, when do we get to do the stuff? And the pastor's like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm reading my New Testament, never read the Bible, because you need somebody, who, a theologian, Right, but when you read the Bible, it's like these things shall follow those who believe, and it says, I'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover, and I'll cast out demons and all those. He's like, When do we get to do the stuff? And he goes, What do you mean the stuff? The stuff that's right here. Don't quench. Don't quench it. So, how do we know if the if the fire of the spirit is, is burning on within you? Well, here's one. Like, do you wake up with the praise of God in your mouth, speaking in tongues, going to bed, speaking in tongues? Are the praises to God always in your heart? Do you sleep and wake up worshiping God, right? It, 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 do, you, do you think of the word and meditate upon it? Are you hungry and for, Lord, I'm not satisfied for what happened yesterday. I'm not satisfied with what happened 30 years ago. My heart is burning for you. So when you think about these things, all these things about the fire of God, William Seymour, man who God used in the, in the Azusa Street Revival, preached for years about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues. He preached about being clothed with power and the evidence of speaking in tongues, but people didn't want to hear it. And the church emptied him and went into crisis, and he didn't give up, and that became the Azusa Street Revival. It takes people that I am going to stay, I'm going to preach, I'm going to declare his word, and I don't care what anybody else thinks. Let me put it another way. When you're, it, it's spiritual warfare. How does that look? Speak to the left devil because you ain't right. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's like, ah, ah, I, 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 I've had enough of this. And so Elijah brought the sacrifice. And it's in the context of the prophets of Baal. It's in the context of dealing with a, a Jezebel, not just a Jezebel spirit, but he's dealing with Jezebel. 
and Elijah's coming against these false prophets and they're, they're getting all excited and they're whipping themselves and doing all and nothing's happening, but he brought the sacrifice. And when you bring the sacrifice, God provides the fire. We're talking about a baptism of fire. How does it look? Father, you provide the sac- you, you, I'll provide the sacrifice. You provide the fire. And so what does that actually look like? Like there's no plan B. What does that look like? It looks like the one-way missionaries. Have you ever heard about the one-way missionaries? They're going to Papua New Guinea. What, what's Papua New Guinea? They were cannibals. They were headhunters. How would you like to do evangelism there? Hey, we're serving finger food tonight, yours. <laughs> That's bad, sorry. <laughs> and so they had these one-way missionaries. They buy a ticket one way to Papua New Guinea, and they would come with their coffins that they'd make with them because there was no plan B. Hey, America, like, we're going to come in times of shaking. And idols will be torn down. Things are going to get real. It doesn't bother me. Because remember in Exodus where things got real. Remember that? There's a story called the Passover. Remember that? They put the blood of the unblemished lamb on their doorpost and they passed over. Oh, this is going to get good. Because you got goats and you got sheep. You got goats and you got sheep. And they can hang out together, but there'll come a time where it says, hey, God. So in your heart, how do you know you got it? And how, how, let me get out of here. You're responsible for keeping the fire. Hebrews 6, I'll, I'll conclude this. And I got way off my notes. And tonight was an interesting night. We got thunderstorms and it's thunder rolling during worship and electrical problems and all that. And you know what? The word of God is going to go out. The power of God is going to come upon you guys tonight. There's been distractions and everything else. Go, hey, nothing's going to tear it. Paul, Paul's going to say in, in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, therefore let us lead the elementary doctrines of Christ and, and go to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God and instructions about washings or baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Let's do this. And so I don't know how I'm...